I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Deshida. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. And speaking of making a difference, as our community of listeners, we need your help. As always, we're trying to grow our listener base. And frankly, the best way to make that happen is, you know, people talking to other people about, you know, podcasts they like. So if you know someone who might like the podcast, if you know somebody who should be listening to the podcast, have them subscribe on their platform of choice, Apple, Spotify, what have you. So for today's episode, we're going to be exploring the topic of offshore wind. We had a short episode earlier this year, kind of during our spring break, where we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of promising developments, some, you know, offshore wind leases. But given, you know, the size of the topic, we decided that we really needed a full episode, you know, to be able to dig in. And so that's what, uh, that's what we're going to do today. So how much did you know about offshore wind before today? I knew that there was a shore and that the wind blows there. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I I knew a little bit from our previous episode that the scale is starting to get big and that uh, things are starting to brew in the United States of trying to get some of these projects going. What about you? Well, you know, with my previous experience in wind energy, I'm comfortable with sort of the, the engineering construction side and performance of onshore wind turbines. But, you know, offshore is a different ball game, And, you know, when I get excited about big machinery, Amy likes to make fun of me. As she should. Well, you know, <laughs> fair or not, it, it, it happens. And, you know, offshore wind is definitely one of those things that is fascinating to me. And I guess she's lucky that we don't live close to a offshore wind construction site, or I'd be talking about it all the time. So before I forget to ask, how was your uh, well-earned vacation last week? Oh, man, we went to Disneyland with the little guy, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I maybe had the most fun. I really enjoyed it. So was I, this a vacation for you or for him? Well, it, it seemed like it was for me once those gates opened <laughs> and we went into Disneyland, because I pretty much ran the show, and I said where we were going to go. And But yeah, we, we had a great time. It was fun. I was gonna thought I was going to ask somebody like, hey, what's your... Uh, What's your power mix here? What do you what are you guys doing for renewables here at Disney? But I I never really got to it over there. They would have probably <laughs> shuffled me off to some little far corner somewhere, and you'd never see me again. <laughs> well, we're, we're we're glad we're glad to have you back. Um, so, what have you got for us this week for a reason for hope? Yeah, well, according to uh, a Reuters article, there's 16 lawmakers in the EU that are uh, working to block the labeling of natural gas and nuclear as sustainable investments, which obviously makes sense. So, you know, the EU commission is proposing labeling, you know, gas and nuclear as green. So there's, there's now a, a resolution by e, EU lawmakers to, to veto uh, that rule. And, and they said, obviously that they weren't given a proper chance to weigh in, which is cool that they're, they're kind of taking up this, this fight. Now the, the problem is so there's there's 16 of them now, but they need half of the 705 lawmakers to vote with them for the resolution to pass. So it's wow. you know it's a big lift. But yeah, that's the reason for hope is that there's uh, there's people pushing back on that as they should. Yeah, I, I think it's a good thing. So pivoting to our our main topic today, you know, offshore wind. You know, over the last decade, it's had huge, you know, developments in in Europe. And Europe's really led the way when we talk about, you know, installed capacity. Mm -hmm. You you now have China really ramping up. In you know, in 2020, they they added more capacity than than any other country. Mm. And then, you know, excitingly, we've got the U.S. market that that our guest is going to talk about. That's that's starting to take shape. So our guest today is Walt Musial. Uh, Walt is a uh, principal engineer and leads the offshore wind research platform at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which many folks probably heard of as, as NRAIL, that's located in, in Golden, Colorado. He actually initiated the offshore research program back in 2003. He chairs the American Clean Power Offshore Wind Standards Subcommittee and uh, is a technical advisor to the National Offshore Wind R&D Consortium. Prior to you know his role in the offshore wind program, Walt ran NRAIL's turbine blade and drivetrain testing facilities. His background is in mechanical engineering, so clearly kindred spirits. 
and he has both his bachelor's and master's degree uh, from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Walt, uh, welcome to Climate Optimus. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. So to start off, when you think about efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? Well, a lot of things these days. Uh, first of all, um, you know, we can't solve the problem if, if we can't acknowledge that there is one. And <laughs> so I'm really optimistic that these days we seem to be coming together as a global community to acknowledge that there's um, a general acceptance now that climate change is real and that human activity is causing it and that there's something we can do about it. So I, I see the, the needed urgency is increasing. And um, when we seek solutions, uh, I see that the the technology that we need to decarbonize the energy sectors of the world is there and we, it's, it's within reach and we, and we can develop it. And and now it's a matter of uh, our own will to to do that. So I'm very optimistic that we can achieve those goals in a sustainable way. We're still going to be impacted by climate change, but we can minimize those impacts. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it's heartening to have it put that way, right? Because we've had, you know, kind of dating back debate about whether climate change was real or whether humans had caused it. And now having everybody sort of agree on the nature of the problem and that there are solutions out there. Yeah, that definitely makes a person feel better. Absolutely. So I'm curious, what was your journey into offshore wind? Uh, Well, I've been uh, working in uh, renewable energy my entire career. And I grew up in the 70s when the oil embargo was really on the front pages of all the newspapers. And I was very aware of those geopolitical events as we were uh, growing up. When I entered engineering school at the University of Massachusetts in the, in the 70s, they had a new program designed directly to address this energy crisis. And it, and it re- really revolved around uh, the study of renewable energy engineering, and I entered that, and I never really looked back. When I graduated with my master's degree in 1983, I didn't really have m- many places to go because the, the industry for wind energy didn't really exist yet. But in um, California, it was starting to proliferate because of the incentives that were available. And so I moved to California, got a job working at as a field test engineer for some wind turbine manufacturers. At the end of 1985, actually, there were 10,000 wind turbines, all a lot of them experimental in California, and that accounted for probably 90% of all the wind turbines in the world. So I was really in the right place to, to apply those, um, that, my education, but sure. it was unstable. Yeah, and I, I moved to Colorado around 1988, and I joined the, um, what was called the Solar Energy Research Institute then, which later became the National Renewable Energy Lab. Around uh, 2003, that's when I was asked to begin an offshore wind program at NREL. And that's really um, what I've been doing ever since. Well, you know, I guess thinking about offshore wind, folks are obviously very familiar with, you know, with onshore wind at this point and, and with solar. Are there unique benefits that, that offshore wind provides, you know, compared to, to other renewables? Well, yeah, absolutely. There are unique benefits. I think probably the biggest thing is the proximity of the resources to places where we need the energy. What people will notice if if you start looking at these resource maps is that the high wind energy resources for offshore wind are located close to these major load centers, which are dotted along the coast. And as we were saying before the program started, this, um, this is where the people live, like almost 80% of the people in the United States live on the, in coastal regions. But these are crowded, populated areas where it's very difficult to build large projects on land. And the resources on, on land aren't as good. So if you go offshore, you can build large projects, generate large amounts of energy and transmit that energy not such a long distance to get to the urban centers. And I've often used this example that takes it would take a wind farm half the size of Long Island to power Long Island. So offshore right. offers this this great extension of these land-based areas where they, where you can build large power plants and get them into the into the centers where the energy is needed. Yeah, that that proximity piece is is pretty huge. You know, and the fact that you've got good wind off the shore of New York City is 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 ideal. So 
I mean, that, that really is kind of a segue, I guess, into my next question, which is, you know, why is offshore wind really kind of garnering an increased focus, you know, in our efforts to decarbonize? Yeah, so building on what I just said, really, it's, it's in these highly populated coastal areas where most of the carbon emissions occur, actually. Offshore wind is, is one of the few options that these states have because of the population density and the lack of other alternative resources. Um, you can't build large solar farms in highly populated urban areas either. So uh, offshore wind becomes one of the choices that, that's the most attractive in, in these areas. So we've seen states like Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina all adopting uh, policy incentives to build offshore wind in significant ways off, off the coasts of their states. It's not all necessarily altruistic to try to save the planet from climate change. There's a significant amount of motivation that comes from the economic benefits when you build ports and ships and new industries along these coastlines, which are often um, languishing because those industries from previous generations have gone away. So it's it's a great um, win-win for a lot of folks. Yeah, it's nice when there's sort of that, that you know, dual benefit. And the, the big jobs word is always gets politicians motivated to, <laughs> to, to open Absolutely. things up. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So just, I guess, thinking briefly for, for folks who may not be aware, you know, can you give some examples that maybe give the sense of scale that we're talking about with, with offshore wind turbines? I mean, Sure. Um, I mean, the, the turbines for offshore wind are larger than the ones that people might, may have seen driving through the Midwest. And they're, they're significantly larger because they're not constrained in the same way in terms of transportation of the components or in the installation of the turbines themselves. So the new generation of turbines that's coming out right now are a class of 15 megawatt machines that are being um, developed by the major manufacturers. And a 15 megawatt machine has a diameter that's more than the lengths of two football fields across. Wow. It can generate power for about four or 5,000 homes. One turbine can do that. And so we're installed in, in multiple arrays, we can power whole cities. For example, Vineyard Wind, which is a, the first project that was approved by the regulators in Massachusetts, is slated to provide electric power for about 400,000 houses. And that's about 62 turbines. And we're getting the cost down by going to larger scales, larger turbines, bigger projects. And so we can amortize a lot of the um, the equipment that's necessary to bring the power in and to connect it to the existing land-based grids. Right. So you're running, you know, fewer collection lines from the turbines to the to the shore, fewer foundations you're having to build, albeit they're they're larger. Well, I guess that, you know, brings up another question. I mean, how do the costs of offshore wind energy compare to, you know, other energy sources out there, renewables, natural gas? Yeah, I'm I'm not an expert in the uh price of fossil fuels and and I know that these are cha these are always changing all the time but we're becoming more competitive and I think there was a a real tipping point that that happened in the European markets around um 2015 2014 when the European auctions started to become more competitive the supply chains there matured the industry started developing and commercializing these larger turbines and we saw that the cost plummet like 70% from where they were earlier in that the last decade. And that's wow. when a lot of these states started to open their eyes and see, wow, this is something that's now within the range of, of what we can consider as part of our energy mix. And that's when they began their promoting these policies for procurement. Now, the cost that we're seeing is based on future projections of what the prices will be and what the um, rate payers will have to pay. And so we're projecting that these costs are going to continue to come down, but it's going to take uh, probably till the end of the decade till we see something like $50 to $60 a megawatt hour, which I think is competitive with pretty much any of the fossil-based fuel sources that are in these coastal areas. It's you know a crystal ball kind of projection to see where we'll actually be when we get there. But there's, a, um, I think, a real challenge, not just to get these costs down in the areas where we are already seeing offshore wind, but 
What about those the other areas that are more the frontiers of offshore wind where we are going to be challenged by, say, lower wind speeds down south or um, hurricane regions where we have to adapt the turbines to resist those extreme events or deeper water where we have to develop floating systems that are right now more expensive than fixed bottom systems. These are the challenges that we're working on at the laboratory to um, develop the research programs to pull those costs down into the same ranges as what the Europeans are seeing and what we're experiencing in the early stage projects of the Northeast. So hearing you talk about kind of the the different frontiers for offshore, we're sort of the they're going to be the next big growth. You're obviously, you can have growth in, in New England. I sense maybe growth off the Carolina coast. Um, where do you see the, the big opportunities for growth in the next you know, 10 years? Yeah, uh, really good question. There were two recent auctions this year already, uh, one in the New York Bight and one in Carolina Long Bay that just happened last week, actually. And we're seeing pretty high prices being paid for these lease areas that developers are buying so that they can get exclusive rights. And if you don't have a lease area, you won't be be able to build the project. So the question really is, where is the next auction going to be and where are we going to move to next? There's great opportunity, and it's already been announced that by 2025, we'll see potentially auctions happening in the Gulf of Maine. We're we're seeing expansion in the uh, Central Atlantic down off of the coast of Virginia, where four new call areas have just been announced. And a call area is a a precursor to a wind energy area that's going to get leased. So it's usually bigger and it's less defined in its boundaries and it's open for public comment and where it's going to be. But there's four new call areas off the central Atlantic in shallower water. Going kind of around the country, the Gulf of Mexico, there's a new call area um, where they're considering wind energy areas off the coast of Louisiana and Texas. Over in the Pacific, in California, there's two wind energy areas. Both of those wind energy areas will be auctioned this year, and we'll see our first floating wind leases uh, get sold in California. And then also we'll see potentially an auction in Oregon by 2025 for two new call areas in southern Southern Oregon. It's exciting. Well, you know, given sort of this the positive outlook, prices coming down, you know, new areas to be leased. What do you see are sort of the primary challenges, you know, facing offshore wind as it scales up? Sure. Um, plenty of challenges. This is a brand new industry. We've only got 42 megawatts installed and we're planning an industry that will provide more than 10% of the electricity for the entire country. And in the states that we've mentioned, it's going to be a lot more than 10% of their electricity. So they're going in big. And so the challenges are important to acknowledge and to embrace as we move into this. Um, One of the challenges, I think, from a technology perspective is that I mentioned these 15 megawatt turbines are being developed right now by the major manufacturers. These turbines are Uh, not yet in serial production. So bringing these prototypes reliably into the commercial markets on time to meet the growing demand is is a key challenge. We're going to have to um, nurture this industry to to bring those turbines into serial production, into commercial production, and to make sure that they operate reliably. From a regulatory perspective, we're we're moving quickly. And um, the, the, this process of new site identification is a challenge, and I think we'll be constrained in the future because we need to understand how much space do we need to leave between projects to avoid conflicts with other ocean users. And so that's going to be one of our challenges, and I guess that we might play into the environmental piece as well. And so other ocean users being, you know, folks that are doing fishing, other, you know, uh, transportation traffic. The, the mammals below the surface, if those count as users. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I kind of put the, the, the mammals who live there and the, the plants and the other fauna, those are the environmental issues that, that have to be considered. With the other users, it's often an economic issue that, that gets created or you know, sharing the ocean space or, or conflicting maybe with some of the practices that, say, fishermen might, might do or with... Um, the military, uh, those are negotiations that have to happen with human beings. 
and then the environmental issues may come into play. For example, we have construction noise that is associated with the driving of monopiles into the seabed. Those impacts can damage the hearing of marine mammals, and we need to control that noise and mitigate those construction activities if mammals are present, for example. That's, um, okay. to me, is completely different than compensating fishermen for, for the dual use. So so when it does come to the marine mammal side of things, um, you mentioned sound. Are there other you know, potential impacts that have to be kind of carefully evaluated as we, you know, expand offshore wind? Yeah, the additional uh, marine traffic can pose an, an additional hazard to um, to the um, marine life that are there. So there are, there are issues, but there's nothing that's extreme that can't be addressed through technology or, or, or administrative solutions that we can come up with. Gotcha. You know, I guess thinking more broadly, you know, here at Climate Optimist, obviously, we're, we're really focused on what are the solutions to climate change and how do we ensure that they scale up quickly, right? That, you know, we know we have a finite window in which to, to get to net zero. So from your perspective, what can be done to accelerate, you know, the adoption of offshore wind? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And it's, it's can be frustrating for people who aren't uh, directly working on the problem. But as consumers in this vast economy that we all live in, we, we all contribute to the problem. So we need to all accept that we're part of the problem and we need to embrace it. So as such, we need to become actively involved in supporting the transition to, to cleaner energy. Everyone needs to see themselves as not a spectator, but as a participant in this. And I'm convinced that we can transition to the, this carbon-free economy that we need to get to without sacrificing the comforts and the security that we currently enjoy. And we're not going to hurt the economy by doing it. In fact, it's just the opposite because there's so many new economic opportunities that, that present themselves. So I think people need to accept and realize that the reality of what we're doing right now, what's happening right now, is that all of our energy systems are going to be electrified. And they're going to be electrified by renewable energy systems and carbon neutral generation sources, which include all of transportation, all of home heating, agriculture, industry. And so we need to embrace that shift and become part of it. And so people need to Buy electric cars, all electric cars, not hybrids, because we need to get carbon free, not just better gas mileage. Rooftop solar, uh, move away from anything that uses uh, fossil fuels. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things, you know, and enter the workforce. The uh, We don't have enough people to do what we want to do. So become part of the workforce that's developing all this. There's, there's tons of jobs out there and we need to em embrace displaced workers from the fossil industries and bring them into this new economy as well. So if we can do this, it's going to be a win-win for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's exciting to hear you put it in that context, right? That that we're creating, not only moving away from fossil fuels and, and the dangers, but that we're creating all this opportunity in, in the meantime. Absolutely. Well, Walt would love to continue our discussion of, of offshore wind, but I know I could always go longer than our time we have available. Just wanted to say thanks for, you know, for coming on and helping educate us on this exciting technology that hopefully we all get to see more of here in, in, the, in the near future, and, and as well on how we can be part of, part of the solution. Yeah, great. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So what do you think about the interview with Walt? I thought it was awesome, but I did notice he really didn't bring up my master plan for my rap battle of the East and West Coast offshore wind rap rivalry, uh, which, I still <laughs> which I still think could really hit this thing home for us. So we're going to have to work on that somehow. But I, one of the coolest things... I, I took out of it is that, you know, that the proximity of this kind of ma massive resource is also just kind of conveniently near, you know, our huge metropolitan areas where a huge part of our population is. Um, totally. Which is very convenient, you know, because I feel like a lot of other areas in the United States, they kind of have their 
their stuff. You know, you got some areas with solar and kind of the Southwest where they got a lot of potential. You got a lot of the Midwest. They got a lot of wind. We've kind of got some hydro out here, but this really is kind of seems like a boon for the, for the East coast and some of those major populated areas up there in the Northeast. So yeah, I, I like this quote. Uh, it would take a project half as big as long Island to power long Island. Right. And when you think yeah. about these things, you realize it's not, you know, this isn't like the movies where, you know, like Tony Stark created something in some building somewhere <laughs> that powers half of the United States or something, you know, you, you got to figure out space and, and transmission yeah. and grid. And there's just all these things that have to happen to make all this stuff work. So I, I think that was a, a really, really positive note. And then, you know, just the scale. I think we talked in our previous episode about the size of, of these turbines, you know, and we talk about a 15 megawatt turbine and it's hard to imagine it, but when he talked about a 200 yard diameter, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just it's just massive to think about. You know, when you drive up, if you've driven by any of the turbines that are on land in the United States, they just seem massive. Or you've seen the trucks hauling the blades down the road, and you're like, "Geez, those totally. things are huge!" And this just dwarfs that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it was really really cool to think about how big these things are, and just imagine how big they are, and the idea of powering you know four hundred thousand homes off of sixty two turbines. You know, that seems crazy. And also just the drop in cost here recently, which is obviously driving a lot of this development. There's a projected drop of another 30% by 2030, which is that's coming down to, you know, $56, which puts you, you know, right in the middle of where natural gas is at. So this is obviously competitive stuff and it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And that's, that's natural gas pre-war in Ukraine. So yeah, right, you know. right, yeah. We could, could be talking about different numbers. What about you? Yeah, I mean, it was exciting to, you know, hear about the big drops in cost. I mean, that's obviously what, you know, enables any technology to really take off. And, you know, we've talked in the past about the huge progress that, you know, has been made in solar and onshore wind. So it seems like, you know, offshore is really hitting its stride now. And and, and right when we need it to be, right? You know, right. we're trying to, to decarbonize by, by 2050. Yeah, he talked about ten percent trying to get yeah. over ten percent of the nation's power. That that's a huge chunk. It is, and you know, I think it's exciting to both have this drop in cost and to see that there's you know nations that are stepping up and providing you know commitments. You've got the the Biden administration, you know, had set a goal of thirty gigawatts by by twenty thirty, which is for context enough to power you know about ten million homes, wow. and then. Just this week, you had Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium announce a target of 65 gigawatts by 2030 in part of its plan, you know, to accelerate, you know, its transition to renewables given given the war in Ukraine. Right. Um, and mind you, when I'm talking in homes for our European listeners, I'm talking U.S. homes. So, you know, likely yeah. probably double <laughs> as many European homes that could be powered. Right. But, but it, yeah, it's exciting to see leaders really, you know, drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is what we, what we need to do and will hopefully help really scale up U.S. offshore market in the way we need it to. And, you know, the other thing I, I really liked, not so much related to, to offshore specifically, was his analogy of, you know, spectators versus participants. Looking at, you know, all of us as participants in this transition to, to 100% clean energy, that this isn't, this isn't something that's in the hands of one person, right? We all need to be part of the solution in in decarbonizing our economy in small ways and in big ways. We we can all be part of that. So I, I like that as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. I just realized something very interesting. What's that? That you interviewed Walt and I was just in Disneyland. Walt Disney? Kismet wow. or what? <laughs> I'm telling you. You know, maybe they've uh, maybe they've got some room on the Tonight Show for you. The stars have aligned. So I, you know, I guess this all leads into the question of what can we do, and what we'd like to recommend this week is that folks email their senators and tell them that we need climate action now, and we have you know about six months left until the midterm elections, and a lot of uncertainty in terms of who will be in office and and ability to pass climate legislation. 
the reality is Europe has set a great example with their repower the EU plan, you know, whether we're talking about commitments to additional offshore solar energy efficiency, they're, you know, in a huge push right now to try to accelerate their transition. And we ought to be able to do the same here in the US. So check out our website for talking points, but we need to email our senators and really push hard on them now to to ensure we can get some climate legislation passed before the midterms. The EU is beating us on everything in this area. And I'm tired of losing. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have to get with it. I want to win. So I think that's a, that's a wrap for this week. Again, if you like the podcast and know folks that might be interested in listening, tell them about it. Have them subscribe. You know, the more folks that listen in, the bigger the impact we have. So thanks again for, for tuning in. Uh, come back again next week for more climate solutions, reasons for hope, and ways each of us can make a difference. Climate Optimus is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co. And as always, don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast. <music>